get their devices properly connected and muted as required, and just make sure you don't have any of the phones near the microphones. Uh, there are. Uh, well, hmm, no, Jim Alston. Uh, I have no apologies at the moment, but what I do have is that Jim Wells has indicated that he will flit in and out of the meeting, and I've just talked to him. He's on a, a CPA meeting, Zoom in the education room, and he had deputised to uh, Jim Allister that uh, he could uh, vote, uh, hold his vote if we got to that position to do that, but uh, we don't have a Jim Allister here, so there we go. So I don't think we want to dash through quickly. <laughs> don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, remind members to declare any relevant financial or other interest the committee meeting is applicable. I'll cover that when we move down through. Uh, draft minutes of, uh, of proceedings. Uh, the draft minutes are at page five. Uh, members are content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? Are we content? Good. Okay. Thank you. And are we happy for those to go on the website? Okay, uh, matters are rising. There's no matters arising at present. And if we move on to the first substantial order of business, it's the evidence deliberation and the functions of government miscellaneous provisions bill. And if we go to Clark's briefing paper at page 13, and I'll let you read that while I try and bring this up on the, on the system. I do apologise, but this is I had to have my computer rebuilt this morning. Okay. So we did clause one, so if we look at clause two which is on the amendment of the Civil Service Commissioner's Order. And Clause 2 sets the number of special advisors in the Executive Office. The current number is six with provision for eight. The bill sponsor is proposing to limit the number to four. Uh, have we any comments? Yeah, I suppose, uh, uh, in the vacuum of the science there, I would nip in to say uh, this is one I'm not 100 percent sure of. It's, it's all about a numbers game in this one. And it that would be easily amended, or even on the floor of the Assembly for that matter, with regards to what number any one particular member thinks is sufficient. Uh, I think I'm in agreement with Jim that the number of eight is, is, is too many. Uh, and I, I do have an issue, I suppose, with the junior minister, but whether there is a necessity for such a post. Um, but whether I agree with four, uh, and whether I agree with limiting the executive office to four is, is a completely different question. If you set a ceiling on how many spads they could have, they don't necessarily have to use them all. So I suppose that's where I'm at in this particular clause. John? Uh, I think we believe that six uh, in TO is appropriate number. Six in TO. Yeah. Mm. Thank Happy. you, sorry, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't finish if I've jumped in. Um, uh, I, I suppose I remain unconvinced that this there is clearly a general um, concern about. This bill addresses many concerns about the conduct concerns that I and my party would clearly share about the conduct of special advisors. Um, I suppose I personally would remain to be convinced um, that limiting the number in this way via legislation is um, addresses the concerns that specifically arose from RHI and that scandal. I um, 
so I, I, I remain unconvinced about that, about whether limiting in legislation. I mean, Sean has just said they think six is an appropriate number. I don't, I, I don't know whether six is an appropriate number. I'm not sure it's, like, you know, there's a sort of smell test here. I suppose by implication, if it's a smell test that something's appropriate or inappropriate, it's, it'll be, it's difficult to have it in primary legislation. Um, and you then get to, um, so I suppose I remain to be convinced whether this is a, a problem that can be solved in primary legislation. Yeah. Jim, do you want to come in this clause too? Yeah, um, sorry, apologies for being late. Um, just to say a word about the format of clause two. The ambition of clause two is to reduce the number in the executive office from eight to four. The mechanism in the original drafting of clause two was anticipating that the junior ministers would continue to have one each and the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister three each, uh, and therefore the mechanism was simply to reduce the First and Deputy First Minister to one each, given a total of four. Um, but since the Deputy First, or since the Junior Ministers haven't appointed, uh, which is a signal to me that they're not required, uh, the, which of course takes you back to the pre-2007 situation, uh, I thought it was more appropriate, therefore, to remove the capacity to have the junior ministers appoint SPADs and to adjust the number that the um, uh, senior ministers could appoint uh, to two each, still giving four. The reason for four is that it seemed to me that eight was so out of filter that you had eight in a single government department, and at that point, there was only eight in the entire Welsh government. It seemed to me totally out of kilter. Um, four seems to me right. Um, obviously, that, well, there might be other views. Uh, on Matthew's point about whether legislation is the place to do it, well, if you don't do it in legislation, you can't do it otherwise. That's the only way you can restrict the numbers. So if in principle it's right to restrict, then the only means is through legislation. Um, Is four right or not? Is four a response to RHI? Well, four isn't going to change the culture of how things are done, but there's other things in the bill that do that. So I think the question in clause two is, uh, is it necessary, right, appropriate to reduce from eight? And if so, is four the right number? Um, I think it is, because I think eight is just unconscionable. And I think the fact that since we came back, there have only been six, presently I think only five. I'm not sure if the DUP, the DUP had a resignation. I don't think they replaced that young lady. So through the biggest crisis that government's likely to face, what the First Minister's office has coped with two and hasn't moved to appoint others when they could bring it up to four. So, six. Uh, that seems to give a total of five. I don't think far. So if the first minister can manage with two, I don't see why the deputy first minister couldn't manage with two. So I think looking at this, as the question is, um, should we be putting a limit on the number of special advisers? And I think the intent of the bill would be, yes, we do put a limit. And the question is, what should that limit be? And whether we should be saying that and taking a view on putting a limit on that now, or do we wait until that goes to the when it goes to the to be debated? But I think with the intent, and I think Sean mentioned the figure of six, and we've been talking about between four and eight. And if we're if it's going to be debated on the floor anyhow, it gives us a, it would give us a starting point for an opportunity if we would be content to take that view. Just could you resummarise? Sorry, the view there, Chair. Sorry. No, the fact is, <laughs> the fact is, I think. I think from the intent of the bill is that we want to limit the number of advisors because where the number is excessive. Mm -hmm. But the point of fact is, look, you know, four might be seen as too small, eight might be seen as too many, whatever it happens to be. The fact that we're looking to limit that, if we go for a figure of, and I think Sean was suggesting there, if we go for a figure of six, but then if it comes onto the floor, it can be debated about that figure. But it's the fact that, you know. The, the difference here in, in Northern Ireland is the bit that we need to put some form of a legislative limit on the number of special advisors. I, I, but I suppose, from the, am I correct, summarising correctly, that there is, seems to be 
there is where there is broad agreement in the committee it seems to be is that there <coughs> is a mechanism for either limiting the number of special advisors or creating a uh, assurance that there is some form of check on special advisors. There may be some degree of consensus on that, but there isn't agreement that it should necessarily be in primary legislation, and that's the bit that we're... Or, and obviously there's a separate question, a, a slightly theological one about eight versus four. I mean, uh, bluntly, I suppose, I'm having worked on this stuff in, in a different jurisdiction and context, part of me is, you know, I think, if it's about the conduct of the special advisors, I genuinely don't see, like, if there are four who are behaving bad, like, I'd rather four who are behaving pretty well, in, or like, I'd rather eight who are behaving well in the executive office than two who are either incompetent or misbehaving. Um, so I'm s still slightly uncertain as to whether the, the number needs to be in primary legislation, albeit I take the point and I agree that there is a, a, a concern abroad about the lack of control over the volume of them and the lack of clarity about it. Mm. Pat? Uh, thanks, Chair. So, just on notes on that, uh, I mean, I've written down that uh, there's, there's a lot of blowback on this, like from the department, and uh, it's my feeling that, personally, uh, that four is plenty, but I've already heard that we're operating at the moment through the pandemic with five, <coughs> and um, I, I, I I like the, the, the feeling that, that if they can operate through the worst times that we've had here, we've already had eight. We had eight. Was there eight or during our Yes. Yeah. And it didn't work. So, you know, we're here to look at the bill as it's coming forward. And I would be probably will talk it over back here with what, what my colleague has said between four and six. But we have agreed we do have to reduce it. And I, I have a liking for the four. Mm. Yeah. Yes, sure. Yeah, well, so we believe that six is appropriate. I don't believe or agree with Matthew that it should be in legislation uh, as to what the number should be. But, but then how do you control it if it's not in legislation? Yeah. I mean, just a general question out there for sort of first discussion amongst yourselves. I mean, if you look at the fact that the other ministers have one spot each, mm. and there you have the executive which is only supposed to be there in a coordinating function, as well as some of the roles that the executive office have. But specifically, it's a coordinating function. And the role of the special advisors to the first and deputy first ministers is to advise the deputy and first ministers, but also to act in a degree of coordination. So you're in essence is saying if you have eight special advisors, you're man marking every other, every other department. And that just instinctively feels wrong, mm. and it, I don't think it is good government. Now, I think by looking at sort of limiting it, that sort of sends out a message that you know your function is the coordination and support of the first and deputy first ministers, rather than uh, providing oversight to every other sort of department. Because I think that's where one of the problems has been in the past, where. And we talked on clause one about the hierarchy of spads and what we were trying to stop, so that one wasn't, you know, one wasn't in charge of the other ones, and particularly with multiple with parties with two or three spads in different depart or a different a spad in different department reporting to the one from the TEO. I think that was the intent of the bill to make sure we didn't get that, which was what with RHI was with. If I am um, correct, yep, sir. Was it myself, sir? Yeah. And, and then Matt after, and then Jim. Here and, and, and we have to look at the savings. We have to look at the cost in all this as well. Mm -hmm. No one seems to have mentioned the company. It's rolled into millions. If you take four from four. So, so, so you know, that, that's, what, that's what it's about as well. It's about the costings. I don't think we can just pick a figure out. I mean, they, they have to show what work's been done for that in order to have four. You know, we're talking here. I don't know what work the uh, executive office has to do. I, I mean, that they need four special advisors in order for it to deliver it. So they'd have to make a case for, for that. So at the minute, I, I have to agree with the bill sponsor here that I, I believe four seems quite a lot, taking in mind that every other minister has one. Well, the question is, it's not that we have to make the decision, yeah. but it's what we said, we have, have, we have, take, we have cons considered it and taken a view on it. Yes. And I think, well, I think if you're content, I think we've taken a view on 
Clause 2. Yeah. Could, could I just make one point? Certainly. If there is a general agreement that certainly it shouldn't be more than six, then support for the amendment which removes the 2007 order, which was the one that gave the junior minister spads, would accomplish that. Yeah. Then the question on the other amendment is whether or not it should be four or six. Yeah. Those who support four can vote for that amendment. And those who those don't those. can vote against it. Just on that point, so I think we could probably get a consensus here as to what use is a spad for a junior minister. Probably even go further than that and talk about junior ministers. But, but, so, so I think we'd be quite clear there, and, and we could probably form a consensus here with regards to we don't think that a junior minister should have a spad, and it should be a collective. I do agree with your point with regards to there should be no way, no way that a spad in an exec office should have rank or have more expertise than an educational spad or an economic economic spad. That's just peculiar. So that's clause one, of course, which we've already talked about. So I think we're nearly. I think we're probably there. Is it too excessive? It probably is. There's a fundamental question that Matthew's toying with with regards to: Do we need to legislate for it? I'm probably of the position we do, but I'm not sure. My fundamental issue is whether four is enough, and and then should we legislate for only four? And would how do, how would that affect and tie the hands of a department of government, which we all wish to do well? Uh, so that's where I'm I'm at. Okay. Matthew, can, can I? I guess raise a suggestion passed with the bill sponsor, and it's a genuinely open-minded question about: Is there a amendment you could make, something you could insert, which requires the, which introduces a degree of flexibility, but still requires the executive office in legislation to justify the number of, as in there is a legislative requirement for them to either. No, I know there's a there, there's a separate biennial report um, uh, provision later in the bill, but. Um, that if so, say, say for the sake of argument, at the beginning, when the when the institutions re-establish themselves in January, um, they decide that the, the the two parties running the executive office or the first and deputy first minister decide that in order to deliver on the programme for government, they require four special advisers each. Um, in order to get ra rather than at the minute, they just appointing those four special advisers, um, they have to make a report um, to the Assembly, and there has to be a debate on a, uh, a motion laid by the um, Executive Office to approve a, a number. Now, that, there is a risk there that you get into either just time wasting or um, you know, people debating, like you, know, you wouldn't want to get people debating the merits of individual appointments on the floor of the Assembly because that could get um, dicey and would probably lead mm. to people not wanting to become spads because they don't want to have their CV debated in, in the Northern Ireland Assembly, which is understandable. But do you see what I'm getting at? I, I, that, that, that's just a suggestion for discussion. Is there, is there a way of it, well, having a bit more flexibility? Well, three? Could I just, I'm going to tie this to Clause 3. Yeah. Because remember, the 99, uh, the Civil Service Commissioner's order was made under prerogative powers, mm -hmm. and the order giving the 2007 order giving junior ministers a spad was made under prerogative Which powers. Right. Yeah. In clause three, I'm not abolishing prerogative powers, but I'm subjecting them to a vote of the assembly. Yeah. So it would be perfectly possible. If the Assembly, for example, reduced the number of SPADs in the Executive Office to four by amending the 99 order, which was a prerogative order, it would be perfectly possible for the First and Deputy First Minister, and they'd have the numbers to do it, to subsequently bring a prerogative order for the approval of the Assembly to, in fact, appoint ten SPADs. But they would have to come and explain they have to come why. To the Assembly. They'd have to explain to the Assembly why. Yeah. 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 So I think that sort of ties it across. Three covers it, Matt. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, like, are you, it would be are helpful you to have that. 
Well, I mean, I suppose it would be, I mean, we're not all making a final decision on every, on our no. view on it. So I'm, I, I'm glad that we've had the discussion now. It could be reflected in our deliberations that this is a, that a concern that was raised around flexibility and whether there is. Okay. So I'm taking a view on clause two. Sorry, Chair, before we go on, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about how this will be framed when it comes to formal clause by clause consideration. Is there... I think, um, and sort of subject to the committee, I says we have taken a view on clause two. The committee's view is, or the a view of the committee rather than the committee's collective view, because I don't think Malus has, has already made his comments clear about what he thinks of the bill and the rest of it. So it can't be a sort of combined view of the committee, but it is a view that we believe that there should be, by statute, there should be a limitation in the number of special advisers, but it's the question of the number is where we're looking at, at the moment. But at the moment, as you're proposing four, that is something that would be subject to sort of obviously debate when we're having the closed debates when it comes before the, before the House. I, I mean, if I was reading it, I would say I'm not sure there is complete consensus that there, there is definitely a need to do it in legislation. I think the way I would frame it is there is, from my perspective, there is a consensus on the need to limit the number of SPADs, but a discussion about whether, uh, whether and how legislation is the best means of achieving it. I still remain open-minded, but I'm not like ruling it in or out, I suppose, at this stage. I, well, I, but I agree of, with the gentleman. Being here a couple of years more, you probably will. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm, no doubt, I'm sure once I cross paths with one of these. Chair, Chair I'm, I'm, I'm of the mind that yeah, we probably do need to legislate for it. The, no, the problem I have is the number. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it should be so uh, as for the right number. And I think uh, we can reflect that because we have taken that view. Okay, you happy? Okay, move on to clause three. Uh, and I think we've covered. Yeah, well, just, uh, just to reiterate, the genesis of this was the bizarre appointment of David Gordon, which was unknown to anyone as to how it was done until it emerged it had been it's done, done by, Royal prerogative. By, by Royal Prerogative by Peter Robinson and Martin McGuinness. And the Assembly, that was a piece of law, a piece of legislation made without the Assembly ever knowing it was made. So the point of Clause 3 is to do two things. To say that if you're ever doing that again, you must bring it to the Assembly for affirmative resolution. Uh, no behind the scenes manoeuvring like that. And secondly, that the specific piece of legislation that was brought in to appoint David Gordon should be repealed. Now, I don't think that's, a, that's really a non-issue because that post has fallen vacant, mm -hmm. but it still technically could be filled. Um, so that's that's the essence of clause three. Comments? Well, if I get out then, I, I get everything that Jim says, and yeah, bringing it to the floor of the assembly makes it that wee bit more. In fact, makes it much more mm -hmm. accountable. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Chair. Um, just to the bill proposal, uh, that prevents TO from appointing commissioners directly. Uh, which I think is sensible. Yeah. And uh, they have plenty of other avenues. Yeah. Well, and they've nice. got the numbers to do it in the Assembly yeah. if they want to do yeah. it, but it's about transparency. Yes. I think the other piece about it is sort of looking at the RHI and sort of the other pieces as well, but the, it also gives protection to the First and Deputy First Ministers or people who are doing it yeah. because they are bringing somebody who has to go through an affirmation process to be able to, to in front of the Assembly. And we do have that sort of the checks and balances for that. So I think that was in the, within the spirit of it. So if we are content to move on to the next clause, I, mean, I would just my, my only comment about this would be I think it's the it's uh, one of the less content one of the less contentious one of the less contentious bits of the um, of the legislation. I mean, I personally I'm slightly you know I'm, I'm you know less offended by the way there are definitely clearly questions around the way um, Mr Gordon was appointed and the way that was done. I suppose um, I would retain a, a degree of doubt about whether it's, um, you know, that, that it was the kind of crime of the century, the, the way it was done. I think it may, and, and with lots of these things, there's a question about whether, you know, that, and it's, it's a question I think we'll need to keep in mind, though I'm sympathetic to lots in this bill, is 
and it's, it's an unresolved question from our earlier deliberations and will continue to be unresolved for me, it's whether we are um, uh, where the kind of democratic norms, good journalism, proper scrutiny is, you know, in a sense it's our job as backbench MLAs, as all of us are, albeit most of us are in executive parties, um, to keep some of this stuff under check. But I suppose in general I think this is a less contentious and, and um, there's a degree of sense in this for us. Not that there isn't in others. But, but I think there's also a question here that has to be raised, particularly about this, about what would have been deemed to be the public interest. And if we take the example of Mr Gordon at the time, that somebody who was one day was a senior producer with the BBC and the Nolan show that was very much the sort of uh, poacher uh, or gamekeeper, depending which way you want to look at it, and within sort of 48 hours he was the, um, the government press officer, for want of better terminology. I think one of the issues was public scrutiny and accountability in that, um, you know, the, I don't think there was an issue of him being appointed. It was the fact that it's the process and nobody was particularly aware of it. Is and if we're, if we're being serious about sort of, and I believe we must be serious about it, about dealing with the sort of the output of the sort of what's happened within RHI and openness and accountability of government, I think that that's a process that we should, we should be uh, encouraging. And actually, you know, the Assembly being aware of what's happening, I think is quite important. Okay. Uh, we move on to Clause 4, uh, Special Advisors in the Executive Office. Well, Clause 4 only arises if Clauses 2 and 3 stand, because Clause 4 is to make sure that anyone displaced from either the as a SPAD uh, is compensated, as would be their right. So Clause 4 is dependent upon 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. um, the only potentially controversial issue in Clause 4, I would have thought, is the date line, where I was seeking to put that in as the 31st of March. I think I've said to the committee before, I would like to keep that under review in terms of the time scale to see whether that still is a viable time scale according to if the bill passes when it passes. Mm -hmm. So I was minded to revisit that at further consideration stage because okay. um, there is an argument and that's one I'm sympathetic to that the closer you get to the end of the mandate, just leave it to the end of the mandate. Mm. Uh, and that might well be an appropriate thing, although whether you I'm not sure if there's a is there a specific set date for the end of the mandate? Uh, could, I don't know if someone can clarify this is about a point of information. Do you, uh, our special advisors remain in office and we have a period period for an elect, for elections here or do, are they, do they have to resign? No, they remain in office. Well, the until, uh, so long as their minister is in office, and ministers remain in office until they're replaced. Yeah, yeah. So actually, even after the election, they stay in office until they're reappointed. Isn't that correct? I think I think come election time, they stay stay in office during the election. Yeah, as I understand it, I think at the point of the election, they probably lose their position. As long as there's but the way. The way it works in Westminster basically is that they can they will remain in post unless they are working on an election. Now, in reality, that means the vast majority of them will have to resign because they yeah. will be working. They'll be expected to work on their Labour or Conservative yeah. campaign. Um, uh, but that hasn't been the process here. The vaccine remains yeah. along with the minister. So yeah. it's not like a part of process where they, uh, at that point, it's, it's normally accepted that they would have stepped down to go and do sort of political work. Here, they remain in post. I think so. And are they, but presumably they are, as they should be, barred from doing yes. election campaigning? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they want to, then they have to resign. Yeah. But on the principle that there should be a suitable compensation, I think we're agreed. Yeah. Okay. 
If we're content with, I say we've had a view on clause four. Can we move on to clause five? Well, clause five, Chair, is about addressing what I've always thought was a, a gap for standards, yeah. in our accountability, namely that assembly members, as assembly members, I have an oversight in the Commissioner on Standards. Uh, it's much more opaque, let's put it like that, in respect of ministers as ministers. And the Assembly passed a resolution back in January 17 saying that ministers should be brought under the umbrella of the Standards Commissioner. And that is what Clause 5 seeks to do and adds a protection for both. Ministers, uh, one of the amendments adds a protection for both ministers and MLAs mm -hmm. uh, to protect them against vexatious mm -hmm. uh, complaints so that the commissioner would only investigate if he was satisfied and the onus is on him to be satisfied that the complaint is not frivolous, vexatious or an abuse of the complaints process. I mean, in my view, is this, one of the, this is one of the critical elements of the, of the bill and um, I think I'll, I'll take your views around the, the room. Sorry, Jim, go. Um, it was not a provision in the NDNA about complaints procedure against ministers, about three, a panel of three commissioners. Um, yes. So I don't there, really know if there is. Relevant. It's suggested in the NDNA, uh, NDNA that uh, the executive office would appoint a panel who would then um, arbitrate on any complaints against ministers. The obvious differences are the Commissioner for Standards is independently recruited. It's an open competition. Uh, he has powers to compel witnesses and documents. The three panel members that are suggested, and nothing has happened about it as far as I know, no, uh, would simply be handpicked. Uh, would not have powers to compel witnesses and documents, rely rather on the information supplied to them by the head of the civil service. And indeed, you'd have the anomaly that the Commissioner for Standards can be one of those three, mm -hmm. but if he was acting in and investigating a minister, and he'd have three. less powers than investigating a lowly MLA. Yeah. So that's why that doesn't seem to me to add up very well. Yeah. Oh. yeah I mean, this is one that you know I've sympathy with and I also commend Jim for the amendment uh, with regards to the vexatious uh, claims or complaints process because I think that is helpful because you wouldn't want to burden either the Office of Standards or a minister for, with aggrieved MLAs or persons out there who do not agree with a policy decision that a minister would take mm -hmm. but we have this bizarre situation only recently whereby there are MLAs being investigated by the Standards Commissioner for attending the funeral of Bobby Story. And yet, standing side by side, shoulder by shoulder, were ministers who are not being investigated by the Standards Commissioner. And I just think that's a really bizarre place to be. Because ultimately, in order for a minister to be a minister, they have to be an yeah, MLA. So that it's, they, whilst they are a minister, they, they still are, they still are MLAs, and they are they are still out there in the court of public opinion, treated the same as us slowly MLAs who are not part of the executive, and nor do we ever see or hear or are provided any information that would be confidential within the executive. So we have no claim or no right. We, we may well be in executive parties, but we have no connection to the executive whatsoever. Our job is to scrutinise the executive. So. I do think that this is a useful clause, and I do commend the amendment. Okay. Pat? Uh, thanks. Uh, just clause 5 brings ministers, as already stated, under the same complaints procedures as MLAs, and I don't have any issue with that at all. Okay. I just want to um, ask a couple of questions, not to force the bill sponsor into giving further, a further evidence session, but, well, actually, it's not just a question for Jim, it's just for discussion, um, so we understand exactly where we are. This, the, in a sense, this clause is explicitly saying that the provisions in NDNA are 
um, insufficient because um, it is not in statute. Um, mm -hmm. where are, where, someone can remind me, where exactly are we in terms of delivering on, on that? What is, the, what is the latest statement on the, on the delivery of the commissioners for, for ministerial standards? That is, uh, to say the least, there's not a lot of information on that. And uh, indeed, it's one of the questions that I've been raising at the party leaders' forum this week, because I've um, had no update on it and where it's supposed to be. And of course, one of the things that it's probably all wrapped up in this as well is there was a, a you know, there was an emphasis on the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service would be leading on a lot of these things, mm -hmm. and we don't have a new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service unexpectedly, which is something we'll discuss later on during this uh, sort of our committee meeting on some other areas of work we were on. So it's it's stalled, but in a way to make sure the provisions of NDNA are met, this clause in the bill actually makes that and allows us to achieve what is within NDNA in a way that's seen as open and transparent. Because the fundamental difference within the NDNA approach is what is the independence of the process. Mm. So this actually has, and bearing in mind we've all agreed to the new commissioner standards, we've all agreed to the role and the responsibility. And I quite like the idea about sort of protections for both ministers and MLAs against vexatious complaints. I think that sets an understanding of where we should be, where we should be going to in this, and it, this does meet the requirement of NDNA. And in fact, this is probably going to go through quicker than whatever is going to be, what will eventually emerge um, sometime next year, potentially, because we've had no real oversight with it as well. And I'd probably take us an action, uh, uh, Clark, to talk to the. Uh, chair of the uh, Executive Committee about uh, where we are on this issue, because again, we were expecting, we were supposed to be getting briefed at the six-month point, and we haven't heard anything. So uh, I think we should do that. So I think, and this meets Gemma. This meets the requirement of NDNA. I, mean, I would, in in terms of how our our report looks. Um, Clearly, this is um, one of the agreed. Um, the, it is clear that there needs to be a better, uh, better enforcement of the, the ministerial code. Um, there have been other um, uh, prima facie breaches of the ministerial code um, in the in the last um, in the last few months, uh, including in relation to Brexit-related issues. Um, uh, so I agree. This is something that is that we need to do something on. I suppose one way one way of framing our consideration of it might be that um, need for the need for legislation. So th since Jim first put this uh, in draft legislation, it might be argued that the urgency or the need for it has been underlined because the um, provisions in NDNA we haven't seen clarity on their delivery. So. Perhaps it would be helpful to underline that in our report that, you know, if the argument from the department and the civil service generally was that this stuff works better when it's in code, then that might have been a more robust and convincing argument if they had come forward that. sooner with delivery on that. Um, so that I think there's an, an argument to be made there that um, if, if that's and that is a core part of the government's or the executive's response. But in order for that to be um, ro a robust response, you kind of need to see the, yeah. the colour of their money. I sort of I accept that as a view, but you know, speaking from uh, my not as a chair position, but from sort of my position as an MLA, the reason why that I don't think having it within the code works, and bearing in mind also as the chair of this committee when we had the permanent secretary here. And she made it quite clear that you know normal custom and practice. Well, normal custom and practice hasn't worked. That's the fundamental difference. You know, if normal custom and practice uh, had worked, we wouldn't have been in the position we were. So I think, again, this if if we're serious about delivering on NDNA, and it needs to have sufficient teeth to be able to be, uh, you know, do the role that we wanted it 
through NDNA and the transformation. I think it has to be. It can't be within a code. It has to be within legislation. Chair, just on that, I, I agree with that point. I think that if we as MLAs wait on the executive, first of all, the cogs turn very slowly at the best of times, and usually they stop, uh, and then there's a lot of effort to get them cranked up slowly again. But remember our role. We're members of the Legislative Assembly. We're legislators. We now have a vehicle in order to legislate. So why, why would you not take that opportunity? Okay. Are we content? Uh, if we move on to Clause 6, Record of Meetings. I don't think we have, do we have any dissension on records of meetings. No. <laughs> Other than to say that, again, the, the amendment on this, let me just check, because there's one of these amendments that Jim brought that became quite... No, I think it's maybe seven. seven. I, I, I didn't think it was six. Uh, six, six is just... The only amendment on six is to reduce the ambit yeah. a bit so that you don't have to record as much as you would have had on the original draft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, took out ministerial indications of intent. Yeah, so, I'm yeah. persuaded that was a bit over the top. So. Yeah. Or I, so again, so I, 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 mean, I commend the amendment. Okay. Are we content? Um, uh, six? Well enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad the amendment has been brought in. I just speak as a former civil servant. It is, um, as we discuss this, whatever the, the merits are, otherwise, you have to be absolutely clear that this is what this is intended to capture. and. There's a huge amount of normal civil service, completely innocent, just practical civil service business, which um, we, we don't want to sort of, you know, it, it will be a bad thing if, if this legislation goes through and, and, and we um, make it just difficult for civil servants to do their jobs ordinarily. So I, I recognise that the, the amendment is designed to um, minimise that risk. Okay. Um, clause 7, record of contacts. Uh, plus, plus seven, I'm minded to remove so that I can bring in a, what is presently labelled Clause 8 and Clause 8A. If I could just explain, um, what I want to do is cover a situation where a minister has a scheduled meeting with some outside body or other, and I'm wanting a, in my new clause eight to make sure that a civil servant keeps an accurate record of all of that. And the only exemption to that is when the minister is meeting with his party. Mm -hmm. I think that's our business. Uh, and then in eight A. I'm wanting to deal with the situation where the minister or the special advisor is lobbied, uh, maybe out at a dinner or whatever, Who's with the uh, and that um, his ear is bent about a particular aspect of government policy. I want to require that there's a note fed back and kept of that. <coughs> Because one of the issues out of RHI, for example, was meetings with Moy Park, which no records were kept of, mm -hmm. and other such matters. So I want to create a situation where if a minister is lobbied, then that has to be recorded. And the definition of lobbying is that which I've stolen from the 2014 GB Act. Mm -hmm. It's precisely the same terminology. So that's what that's about. Mm. So the proposal is we take out clause seven, but we go with clause eight and clause eight A. Yes. Yeah. Uh, would the effect of taking out clause seven, what would the effect of taking out clause seven be in terms of reducing the the burden, or in terms of clarifying the burden? Well, clause seven. I think Clause 7, as was, was too woolly, and uh, I think clause, the new Clause 8, which in due course will probably become 7, uh, whenever it's 
Or renumbered. Recast. Uh, the new Clause 8 uh, is pretty crisp. A civil servant, other than a SPAD, must be present to take an accurate written record of every meeting held by a minister or special advisor with non departmental personnel about official business. And so, that's so the intent should be that if a minister is in his duties as a minister yeah. is meeting with anybody, yeah. it should be in some form recorded. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is yeah. standard practice everywhere else. Well, if it, it's in code, um, uh, no, I, I just I suppose Mike just to test a hypothetical scenario. Minister is in Tesco shopping and um, someone they know, look, a local property developer, school headmaster, so the side and says, um, Minister, I just want to have a quick word with you here. This is a constituent that they have known for many years, they've worked with because it's a, some a local business person or community person. Yeah. Um, so I just want to call you for a second about this issue. Um, uh, and, they, and then they lobby, and that's, that's, what, that's lobbying. That is a, that is yeah. a lobbying moment. Yeah. Um, the minister who, in that scenario, uh, sort of g g normal c c kind of courtesy, and you know, we, are, we live in a very small kind of, you know, this is a very small community, might be to very politely say, I can know that, yep, 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 listen, yep, but not along, and say, I'll get someone in the department to get back to you. And they forget. What isn't there a risk that in, if that then becomes some way criminal, that that's a, what would be, what, how does the minister defend himself in that situation and in creating a criminal penalty there, don't you, um, do you risk a situation in which it's very, very difficult for a politician who is honest, if a bit absent-minded or just if a bit busy to defend themselves? Well, th there's no criminal offence. In clause eight or eight a, yes, it's it's just an obligation of the law that you shall, if you've been lobbied, that you put a record of it into the department. Not expecting an elaborate record, but you might expect. Met the managing director of Moy Park. He told me that we ra we radically needed to change certain aspect of policy because mm -hmm. it was hurting his industry. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I would see being captured, um, and then if that leads to a more formal meeting, where he says, "Right, come in and see me," uh, and then that's a formal meeting, there'll be a proper note of that meeting under New Clause Eight. I, I, I take the point, and uh, and also that it's not a criminal. You're not creating a criminal offence, albeit people will say this is you are. Um, Criminal in the sense that you're in, it, it, you're in breach of the law. You're in breach of if, if you, you could be deemed to be in breach of the law, um, albeit there's no specific offence with a, a tariff attached to it. But to test a different, like a, a, a like a, a, a hypothesis in which said headmaster, GP, whatever, and it doesn't need to be a business person. And we know that the organisation you've named was in, heavily involved in lobbying during the RHI process, and, and, mm. and not all of it to the public good, mm. uh, by the looks of things. Um, but they say it's a headmaster, or say it's just any other person, a, a person in the community who wants to lobby an, a minister. Um, they could record surreptitiously the, that conversation. Um, they could then use that um, against the minister in question. They say if the minister doesn't go back, if he or she doesn't go back to the department immediately and organise that meeting, if they are absent-minded in, in an innocent way, um, there is then you know, the Georgian blogs who's lobbied that minister in Tesco or at a, at a school parent-teacher evening or whatever, sports event, and say, look, I lobby this person and they were in Britain. Just that as an unintended consequence would worry me. And what would, what would be the defense to that, do you think? Or what, not that it's, not a, it's not a criminal defense, well, because it wouldn't be. Well, I think it's important that it's not a criminal offense. It's, it's a legal obligation. It's a statutory duty uh, put upon someone. And it's, it's, it's refined by the definition of what being lobbied means. Yeah. Uh, being lobbied is about the development, adoption, modification of any proposal of government to make or amend legislation, the modification of any policy. Uh, 
in, in relation to contracts, in relation to financial assistance, in relation to licenses, uh, or the exercise of other functions of government. So it has to be something specific uh, that you could say, right, I've just been lobbied about that. Yeah. Yeah. And just having been lobbied about that, I need to have, make sure there's a note of that in the department. Because I don't want to be in a situation of another RHI where it, this person says, they told me such and such, it's a protection for me to keep yeah. Yeah. Tell it to the department. Yeah. Not Just looking for a four page essay, yeah. but you're looking for saying to your pr private secretary, would you take a note that on Saturday past I was lobbied about X? And just for looking at the existing ministerial code, but also within the Nolan principles when we talk about objectivity, yeah. accountability and openness, there is a burden on the minister, yeah. if that happened, to report that. Yeah. But yeah. one of the problems is that that has not happened. Has not, yeah. And Matthew, unlike the system that you and I would have been aware of when you were with various ministers and they'd been approached, even if they went to a dinner, Somebody would have sat down and made a note that they were at a X dinner where the following people were at. They won't necessarily record what was said, yeah. probably won't, but they will say that there was a record of a potential meeting, which is what this is about. Yeah. Now, you know, the fact that it's all, it was already in the existing code and it didn't happen, yeah. I think this underlines the reason why it probably has to go into yeah. statute. But, but that's in their capacity as a minister, Chair, that's in their, that's in their X dinner. And if the private secretary's there, they'll be there because they are speaking at, you know, the Lions Club in Bally, wherever, and the, and the private secretary's there to join them. And so I suppose I still have a concern that there is the potential for a huge amount of um, utterly innocent behaviour, particularly in, and I think this is, so he, here's a thought I would put to the, to the bill sponsor, recognising there is merit in, 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 the, in, the, in the intent behind it. But, you know, if we have a very particular some, like, structural political challenges here, and some of them come out through RHI, we have a very unique set of institutions to reflect a unique society. We're also a very small society. We are also, by, defin by, by definition, most of the people who, most of the constituencies uh, in Northern Ireland are rural constituencies. Very often people know one another very, very well. They expect to call it. The MLA is someone they see in the pub or in the church or in the chapel or in the Orange Hall or in the GAA in club the or in the supermarket. And that is a particular, and that presents a particular challenge for the most honest politician of any hue because they will be collared and lobbied in the course of their daily life in a way that probably isn't the case actually in, you don't, no one here really is a, that often, a, you know, a, an absentee constituency MP who, go, who is sort of like Winston Churchill was in Dundee and you, you go back once a year and they, they well, you know, people are living there in the communities that they represent. So I suppose, think of, from that perspective, I think very careful that we don't capture and, and uh, you know, that would be my concern. Well, well, I just say. Okay, thanks. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. No, I just a quick point. Um, I'm, I think sorry, Chair. Oh, sorry. Oh, we I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Uh, clause okay, seven yeah, is, uh, is already put down. It's uh, proposed to be replaced by clause eight, which you want to come on to. But clause eight, this puts a legal requirement for civil servants to be present at the meetings. Uh, this seems very sensible to me in very simple terms. Okay, without going into all, all about it or trying to stretch it out as much as possible. That's a sensible uh, put in. And clause here, eh? this clause proposes an amendment to introduce a requirement for a minister or special advisor to provide a written record to the Department of all such lobbying and for the Department to retain such records. This is important for accountability, it is important for me as an MLA, and it's important for all of us as legislators to step up to the plate and do the job which we were elected in order to do. Uh, there has been no evidence on this. I can't see, bar maybe what comes out through uh, RHI, but this to me seems very clear. It's clear enough to me. Gemma? Yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, I, I think that this is already in the code, so I don't see the need for it. But I'll also say that I actually agree with Matthew. It might not happen very often, but I think Matthew has a very, very valid point. So that's, that's all I just want to say on that. Oh. Chair, yeah, uh, I suppose this is where one where I think that Jim's amendment maybe has clouded our judgment on it further uh, and maybe hasn't simplified it. 
for the simple fact that the old clause 7 and 8 per se that on the face of the bill at present time albeit Jim has said Willie um, it was sort of more clear cut whereas and, and my danger in all of this was the the colouring because in record of context old clause 7 it, it, Jim talks about and retain records of all meetings I don't think any of us could foresee walking down the aisle of Tesco's and bumping into a teacher as being a meeting, but oh, nonetheless, it's still lobbying. The same way as you leave a minister leaving question time in this chamber and walking to their office on the second floor, and some edit of an MLA comes up talking about the biggest bunkers idea that he has in his head, and then the ministers are expected to record that down as having been lobbied for. So, again, that's where I would worry about making it do detailed so that an opposition MLA or someone, a member of the public even, that would not be sympathetic to a minister or their policies may well try and use it as some sort of weapon. Uh, also, too, just a wee intricacy I've seen when, I, when reading this is that on clause 8, the new clause 8, sorry, uh, you talk about um, you talk about it still being an exception for liaison with your with the minister's political <coughs> party, and I understand why that has to be in. But yet, it's not in the new new clause eight a. And I'm wondering, is that an omission? And should, if it's important for clause eight to have that exception, <coughs> should it also be in clause eight a? I don't know the answer to that. I'm just throwing it out there out loud, which sometimes is dangerous. But uh, well, there might actually be something in that latter point that maybe it should, because I think actually my original yeah it did in both your old clause eight yeah. and seven it states yeah the exception in both cases. Okay, let me let me think about that. I might I might um, withdraw the one that's there and resubstitute. I think that's probably a fair enough point uh, to add that to it. Uh, on the point about um, uh, no, I think I now remember why I, I did think about that. And I suppose I was thinking, well, if somebody wants to be very Machiavellian, they will s they will make sure they do it in a party meeting rather than. Uh, in the open, but maybe that's something you can't legislate against. Uh, the point about the scope of the lobbying, like I remind you, this is precisely the 2014 GB mm -hmm. provision about lobbying. I don't think it's been hugely problematic uh, in, in GB, and I think it's both a, I think it is a protection for the minister. You say, you know, somebody, some malcontent raises the issue that, oh, I lobbied you about that and you didn't do anything about it. Well, you know, would it not be a good idea for a minister to get into the habit? Mm. Sure, he always carries a notebook uh, of saying, right, Monday morning, no, I must report that I was lobbied with X, Y, and Z. Or? As a protection for himself. Or as an MLA, just to put it in, if we're walking down the street and someone stops us to try to lobby us, we ask them to contact the office. Yeah. And we all have case workers, so it's only yeah. when you have that contact. And that's the same thing that I would expect from a minister as well. Contact my office. I think one point, just looking at the 2014 Act, and I should declare as an interest, as a former civil servant, I um, worked for a, a consultancy which was a consultant lobbyist for a brief period after I, um, before I became an MLA and after I left the civil service. Um, the 2014 Act, just on the face of it, talks about um, consultant, the meaning of consultant lobbying. Is there a clarity that could be added to the bill about that would address, so uh, for the purpose of part one, the, a, a person carries on the business of consultant lobbying, and that's about reg. This is a, I'm specifically looking at the. I don't know if it's the same legislation. This is the transparency of lobbying, party campaigning, and yes, uh, the 14 Act puts duties about registering consultant yeah. lobbyists, mm -hmm. and says therefore who has to be registered. But it also, uh, I'm I'm extracting from it what it means to be lobbied. I think the problem with restricting it to consultant lobbyists. 
you know, so if my park, I keep using that example, uh, does the lobbying through their managing director, uh, it doesn't count, but if they do it through their firm. PR consultant, it does. Yes, but I think isn't there? Couldn't you draw a definition which is there's a, you know, if there's a clear business and if the person has a clear material business interest in the that which is being lobbied. Now I get that you will get then into, but you know, you're then drawing a distinction between. <laughs> you then draw a distinction between the primary school headmaster who's lobbying about playing field um, provision and the Moy Park chief executive or or any other business who's saying so there's a is there a, is there a an amount you know is there a clarification which is that people who are lobbying in the course now that, now that then gets you into um you know but, but that definition of lobbying i suppose you're at least making clear that it's about people making a profit as it were I almost said people before profit but i'm <laughs> people making a profit people you know lobbying to advance a business interest as opposed to well, the lobbying definition is you're trying to change the law, you're trying to get a license, mm -hmm. you're trying to change policy. Yeah. Like, it's not just talking to them in generalities. It's about trying to induce some change. Does that not speak to an interest? It, it does, although I suppose my question is, and I, and I, and I don't know the answer to it, and, and I'm, I realise it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a question that we're going to be able to answer in the next few minutes, but is there a way of distinguishing between? I keep using the primary school head, head principal as if they're the you know the font of all decency, but the primary school head headmaster who is you know, arguably you could it could be a you know could be a religious minister, could be a charity person, could be a, a, a charity campaigner. Now you then get into difficult territory that they have a, do they have an interest in it, but that you distinguish that from the Moy Park. Or the developer, or the, you know, whoever else. That's the question of how you make that distinction. Yeah. I, I, just I, I agree. That's not. I think just and uh, looking at this, um, I think there's sufficient discussions here. Um, looking at the bill sponsor here about potentially now keeping clause seven in. Uh, or are we still? No. no. No, seven is really replaced by the new eight. Mm -hmm. Seven was targeted at the organised meetings, right. the meetings they hold. Um, Look, I don't think, sort of, just taking the temperature of the room here, I don't think there is a, a, a degree where we can actually say that we have a, a combined view on this at this stage. Uh, Clause seven is proposed to be clause. Uh, uh, by clause 8a, and uh, uh, for me that seems clear enough. Uh, that's what I've said, so I do have a clear view on it. I don't know where, I, I don't know where else it is. Okay. Uh, I am going to think more about Paul's point, yeah. and at this moment I can't think of a good reason not to include the political meeting uh, or the politi with the political party. I don't have an answer to Matthew's point, and maybe there is no answer to it. <laughs> That's usually the case. Um, but I'll think a little more about that. Emma? I'm sorry, I know I raised this last week, and again, it's nothing personal to Jim, <clears throat> but I find this has turned into another evidence session. You know, mm. we're doing the, the domestic violence bill in the Justice Committee and it's clause by clause and that's fair enough Paul you know the discussions we've had but on numerous occasions people here have said I'll ask the bill sponsor but the bill sponsor isn't here to be asked about the bill yeah. we're here to do the clauses that's right. so I'm sorry but it doesn't sit right with me I still think it's conflict of interest and again it's nothing against Jim but I've been thinking about it all week and today it's it's more evident and um, you know especially when Jim said I'll take Paul's point of view and I'll fine tune something about what Matthew said that's, that's not what clause by clause is. So I'm just putting it out there again. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it up to yourselves to justify it. Just to clarify, we're not doing clause by clause today. We are doing committee deliberations 
Um, so with a departmental bill, sometimes the departmental bill team would sit in yes. and would provide clarification just to assist the committee to reach a view. So today is a clause by clause um, session um, and the committee has a, has a right to reach a view on, I suppose, the length of time that you're discussing things, but very much today it is during the deliberation phase. Okay. And then at the clause by clause, uh, you will vote on, and each member will have a vote um, in their capacity as a member of the of the committee. And will Jim's vote count in that? Um, yes, Jim would be a member of the committee. It yep. so happens Wh which it's a Jim? member of the committee is a sponsor. <laughs> the cleverest Jim or thick Jim? Is it me or him? <laughs> Jim Hollister. Oh, Jim Hollister, clever Jim. Okay. okay. Right. Thanks have we that. considered it? Seven, eight, and eight A. Yes, I think we have. Yeah. Can we move on to clause nine? Use of official systems. Yeah, and again, uh, I suppose I'm grateful for Jim for the amendment on this too. Uh, use of official systems. I, I've always had a massive issue about someone making a mistake and having a device where there's a number of email accounts on it, and then just by pure accident hitting the wrong button, typing out an email in haste and then hitting the wrong button. Um, that in itself shouldn't be the crime. The crime should be the, the non-registration of that and then the rectifying of that. So you know that could be done in many ways, uh, registering it, making a note of it by an official or just forwarding it on to the, the correct account um, and that in itself then creates the, the public record that then could be obtainable. From uh, with regards to accountability and transparency, which I think is very key. So I do think that this clause is worthy and has a lot of merit. And I now think that the, the shifting of the crime, I think, is to be welcomed. Can, um, but this, is, uh, this is the clause, isn't it? If I'm looking at it, right, it's proposed to create a criminal offence. Yes. Mm. And uh, the sanctions. I feel, or I, it's just a personal view, a bit heavy at the moment. Uh, I know that the proposer has uh, spoken about an amendment in it, uh, but have we got anything back? Has the committee chair or the committee clerk got anything back? Have we written to the Department of Justice on this amendment? No, sir. No. No, no, sir. no well, should we? Do we need to? Yeah, Obviously, I don't think we do, but okay. it just, it, that's it's a matter for the committee. But I made the point last week, I think, that the idea at the moment it's a hybrid offence. That's to say, it can be tried either in the mm -hmm. magistrate's court or the crime court. Uh, if it was simply a summary offence, the person accused would have no right to a jury trial uh, because the penalty is only six months. So it's by making it a hybrid that you do one of two things. You afford the PPS the choice of bringing it in the petty sessions or in the Crown Court, and you afford the accused person the right, if it's been brought in the petty sessions, to elect for trial by jury. And I don't think if you're going to afford it the right to trial by jury, the Crown Court penalty could be less than two years. I can't think, not say there isn't, but I can't think of any criminal offence in the Crown Court where the penalty is less than two years. Because the maximum, of course, is in the petty sessions <coughs> is 12 months, um, though here it's six. Yeah, like many of these uh, clauses, it already uh, is in the codes. I think it, it brings about the problem in terms of a criminal offence. Um, I think the issue that was raised, uh, proportionality. So I think it's over the top and it's not needed. Matthew? I, I, I am, I mean, in the sense that the, 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 the tariffs come down, that's the right direction, but I, I for very, would be, just remain, while open to discussing lots of aspects of this bill, I remain very concerned about the, the principle of, of this being a criminal offence, not just because I could probably, 
as I sit here now, uh, bring up evidence on my Hotmail account of me having been in breach of a hypothetical law countless occasions in my... Resign. Group. Resign. It's changed. I, I, I already did, Jim. <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad I did. But, um, but um, uh, I, I just think, you know, I suppose two things. Fundamentally, I'm, I'm very cautious about creating a, making this a criminal offence per se. I just think that would... I also think there's the question we should consider as a committee and reflected that if part of what we want to do is ensure that we have good people in um, government, in the civil service, in ministerial office, in special advisor posts. We need to think about the, chill, the potential chilling effect this would have um, for people. And I understand that the bill sponsor has said when we discussed this that um, you know, there, would be, there would be defences and there would be obviously a uh, like um, it would be a test for the public prosecutor to say, well, is this really worth, you know, this is clearly, um, and you'd have to pass many hurdles, but still in all, creating a criminal offence, it being theoretically a criminal offence for someone to use their hot meal um, on a, you know, in a busy ministerial visit, it still just gives me pause. I'm very nervous about it. I think, so, sorry, just, sorry, the, I'm just, I'm sort of reading this, and again, the use of this official system. So if we go back to the RHI, one of the issues was that a lot of the emails were being run on an on official server, and a lot of the government work was being done. I don't think it was an official server. I think it was they were using private email. I don't think it was a... No, no, they were actually... They were, it had to be recovered it? from a separate server. It had to be recovered from the official. DUP's own server. Yeah. A lot of the information had been uh, done through their own server. And let's transpose it a slightly different way. If we looked at it, and this is a question that maybe we should be asking, if you were a civil servant with government classified information, doesn't matter what the classification was, and you were using that on a non-government secure system, and you were using it using your private accounts, or and you weren't accounting for it, that would be a significant offence under the uh, civil service code of conduct, and we are talking about special advisors who are technically civil servants, and we're talking about ministers who will be dealing with official, sensitive government information. So that's what we're, we're not talking about inadvertently sending something on a hotmail account. What we're talking about is, and I think one of the biggest problems that we had, and this was a thing that I was very struck when we had the evidence from the head of the civil service, it seemed to be, they didn't seem to be any sense of uh, concern about the fact that there seem to be unofficial communication systems, but, but, but Chair, they'd never even heard of Hil Hillary but, Clinton. But Chair, with, with, with respect, that's wrong. What you've said is that we aren't talking about people using private, but we are talking about that. The yeah, part one of, of Clause 9 says, it shall be an offence for any minister, civil servant or special advisor when committing on government business by electronic means to use personal accounts. No, no, that's the amendment. Indeed, okay, yes, fair enough. But yeah. there still remains the possibility that there, there is a, still a criminal offence that yes, exists. The criminal offence is failing to put it back. Yes. Failing to put it onto the official system. It, it, the criminal offence is not the misuse no. of it's your private. The, it's failing to record back into the official system that which emerged there. That's now the criminal offence because, like, I listened very carefully to the the points that were made, and that's why I uh, the amendment yeah, yeah. which redrafts clause nine. It says that if out of necessity it is not possible to comply with the requirements of subsection 1, the minister, or as the case may be, special advisor or civil servant, must within 48 hours or as soon thereafter as reasonably practical, a copy to the departmental system any written material generated during the use of the non-departmental devices, and b make an accurate record on the departmental system of any verbal communications relating to departmental matters. And that, of course, is to deal with the mischief that in RHI private systems were being used to hide things. And now the criminal offence would be not the using of the private system, but the failing to transfer from the private to the official the information. Can I ask one further question? Yes, to the room, but the bill sponsor will probably know more. In terms of sentencing guidelines, what's the normal practice for sentencing guidelines to be? If this bill was passed with this clause in, what, what, when does, when, how and when are sentencing guidelines produced? 
Well, sentencing guidelines wouldn't be produced by the, they're, they're generally produced by the Lord Chief Justice Office. They wouldn't be produced for as minor an offence as this. Like, you wouldn't see sentencing guidelines for much under where the penalty would be 10 years. Right, okay. So okay. I don't think you'd be getting sentencing guidelines. Chair, yeah. on this, so it's very important, and, and this, is a ma this has been a very positive and a major shift hmm. from Jim, Jim's published bill. The amendment does great things, I think, and, and I accept it because I don't want anybody penalised for making a mistake hmm. by hitting a button by their thumb. So this is much more, it's become a much more, uh, so if you, if you value transparency and accountability, if you recognise that there are parties within our executive that are quite authoritarian, authoritarian in nature, uh, Keep yourself. And, uh, and, and, and if you look at the civil service not being fit for purpose and major failings, failures there, then I do think that this, something like this is the right thing to do, the right direction to go in. And to me, it's, it's totally acceptable to have a tariff. And I get Jim's, I get Jim's issue around flexibility with regards to making a hybrid offence, because there might be a case where there's a real public interest. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that's why it's essential to keep it hybrid. If you keep it hybrid, then I don't think you have a choice with regards to the tariff. But remember that we only set not exceeding tariffs. Mm -hmm. It's very rarely that we do the opposite. Uh, and there's a fundamental question there around whether we should. So. I'm okay with that. Remember, it's a term not exceeding two years. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that injects the flexibility of a hybrid uh, case, and I think that's, that's a good thing. And of course, and just sort of um, taking the, the committee's view, of course, it's the deterrent value mm. of the process. Yeah. Okay. Like I've said before, any good of criminal offence on the statute book. If it doesn't have to be used, it's working. Yeah. Okay. okay, moving on. To, uh, we can take the view on that. Move on to Clause 10, Register of Interests. Well, it's simply to um, put the same, uh, equalise the burdens for making a, an entry in the Registry of Interests mm. uh, for ministers and special advisers. Um, but it's relatively uncontroversial. I've adjusted it to bring it into line 21 to 28 days in relation to uh, what's in codes, so as there's, they marry up. And the only other change I'm proposing is to define family members in the manner in which they are already defined in other legislation. Mm. So that's tidying up. Are we yeah. happy to take that view? Content, move on. Clause 11. Clause 11 is the other criminal offence. And again, it has been adjusted to um, bring in the defence of a reasonable cause and to, in fact, reverse the, the onus, essentially, so that the prosecution has to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the course of behaviour was not reasonable and the penalty has been reduced from the original anticipated five maximum to two years, but retains the hybrid facility. Um, and it's about, obviously, sharing to the advantage of others official information. Mm -hmm. It takes care of the points raised by Matthew and others about this bad who is part of his duties has to brief the press. If it's a lawful pursuit of official duties, it couldn't be an offence. And if it's, for example, something done in foot of statute, like providing information on FOI, it couldn't be an offence. Mm -hmm. So it's really to catch and only catch the person who is abusing their position and enriching themselves or others or attempting to through the sharing of information that they shouldn't be sharing. Well, there's no reasonable excuse for doing that. I have one question of this, and it comes down to the tariff. And I see, I notice the comments from the DOJ and uh, what other comments are have come through about it, about the size of the tariff. 
But then I'm also struck by the uh, serious fraud office and the rules on insider trading, which is an mm. essential. This is insider trading, mm. and you know, I, I, under, I understand redu reducing in the penalty. But bearing in mind, if we're talking about something that's giving somebody some very considerable financial advantage, this is, I believe, is as bad as insider trading, and should be looked at in a similar sort of way. So I hear the views about reducing the tariff, but I, I, have, I have a degree of concern about bearing in mind sort of the proprietary information that uh, has been passed and we have seen from the RHI inquiry that went and the considerable volume of money that is potentially involved in these issues. So I am asking the question, are, are we taking a view that we are happy with the lower tariff or do we uh, want to go back to what it was? Chair, on that specific question, I think it's sensible that Jim has removed it down from or moved it down from five to two. Uh, when you look at other uh, tariffs in relation to this type of crime, I do think the uh, the the uh, cr critical line in all of this, and, and and Jim had this in his original, was that um, any official information to another for a financial or other improper benefit of any person or third party. Uh, to me, or that's the new. He had some summer in his original clause. That's the key line here, and I think that is a criminal offence, and it should be. Uh, and I, I, again, I welcome the clarification and the amendments to to reduce that crime with regards to all the other things that a SPAD or an, an official or a minister would be having to do in the course of his duties. And of course, there's sometimes th there is this, there has to be a defence too with regards to what is in the public interest what should be out there in the public sphere. So there has to be some sort of protection for whistleblowing also. Yeah. And I think that, that's also applied. I think uh, um, I may retain, notwithstanding our previous conversation, I still retain at least a, a fair degree of concern about creating a criminal offence uh, in general in relation to this for some of the same reasons as before. And um, notwithstanding that, can, can I just ask, Chair, your point about you mentioned the SFO and insider dealing. Do you have a, is there a particular tariff that you think that should be equalised? No, it's, it's again because if this was just the norm, if, if this was inf confidential information or information that had been shared, but one of the one of the issues we have in Northern Ireland is particularly around the RHI that there were very clear examples of people being given inside financial information that they had a significant financial opportunity to be able to do it and they were able to grow and develop their businesses and other businesses were specifically excluded. So in some respects this is not just a question of sort of proprietary information being released. It to me, bearing in mind we, we have to why we have to bring this is there's something more significant about this because I feel that um, you know, what we have seen it's not just an example of bad behaviour. It's been seen as behaviour that will have made a really significant difference to companies' profits, but it's also meant that a lot of people have had been very badly financially um, disadvantaged. And if you were looking at something of, if you were looking at definitions of insider trading and the flow of information that was coming that would be coming out in some companies and how that would be dealt with by the serious fraud office or also would be dealt with by sort of uh, in in the city of london or something like that i just i just have a i just have a concern that um, this is probably mo this is a more this is a more serious element of it I, I think we're to be honest i think we're venturing into quite we're making quite vague statements here yeah. the insider dealing relates to price i'm, I'm just looking at the the relevant statute says Price affected securities; those are they are. Um, when you're in the heavily regulated world of um, uh, um, the of, of, um, publicly traded entities and entities that are that are there, are there are clear definitions of what what, what represents price sensitive information. Uh, informa there are clear definitions of what should be disclosed to the markets. There are entire industries of people in, for example, the City of London who, and New York. Who did. I think it's quite difficult, I think, for us to, I'm not sure, I think it might be a bit of a fool's errand for us to try and sort of 
lead the world in kind of um, creating criminal offences for this kind of thing, albeit clearly there are concerns that were out of RHI. Um, uh, I, um, and I understand why... I think that, sir, it's not just, and just for, I think for the committee as well, it's not just a question of RHI. If you consider NAMA and the issues that were going on around NAMA, and if you consider some of the other issues with Red Sky, you can run off a whole catalogue that's specifically within Northern Ireland have gone beyond what would just be passing of information. I, com I completely agree this with that. A, yeah. I know I completely agree with that. I just think there's a we need to be careful about it, insider dealing as this because that's a, there's a, there are specific legal yeah. um, okay. issues. I think I, I sort of I sort of my my background and experience isn't in the law, so I'll sort of jump. I just wanted to make one comment. I think there's a general public expectation, I would have thought, from how far people were scandalised by RHI, that the Assembly yeah. will be seen to do something that can be pointed to as a serious reaction to it. And I would have thought creating a deterrent so that a SPAD wouldn't think it appropriate to distribute to his family members advantageous information about when something was going to close. I would have thought making that a criminal offence would be in line with what the public would expect us to be doing out of RHI. Mm -hmm. you know, I, think, and I think these are modest steps, but I think it's, they are deterrent steps, and I think they're marking the, the communal and the assembly disapproval for what went on in the past. But in a sense, I suppose I'm not disputing that. I agree with that. But um, my question is, was, as we scrutinise this, what are the what are is exactly what are the effect we're trying to have, and what? So one question. So it, in a, in a sense, though I am sort of personally disapprove of the criminalisation aspect in both clause nine and clause eleven, and worry about them. The the thing that exists, the, the thing that's been trying to be. Um, Mitigated against in clause 11 concerns me more. The, there is a more. Um, you mentioned a chair, Red Sky Nama. There is there is a clearly a culture of yeah. stuff that people want to see addressed. And if there's a and if there is and if it can be done in legislation, good. Clearly there are real concerns about all that. I suppose so. Though I'm still concerned about the. the um, principle of criminalisation in both Clause 9 and Clause 11, I think the problem being got at in Clause 11 is one that needs to be got at somehow, and we need to be clear doing it. But I have a couple of other specific, but I'm not sure we have time to discuss them now. One of them, and I don't know if it's been addressed, and I was trying to get up specific amendments, but for example, we talk about in Clause 11, um, uh, directly or indirectly, confidential and or commercially sensitive information for the financial or other potential benefit is there a risk that if we say other potential benefit, that just in, there's just a huge swathe of on the what, well, what, in light of uh, in light of the evidence sure. from the sure. Human Rights Commission that was yeah. changed to financial right. or other improper benefit. Okay, that has changed. Yeah. Okay, that's been done. Okay, um, but the point the point simply I'd make about this is what happened in RHI in terms of giving information to others turns out was not a criminal offence, as the police have confirmed to me there are no investigations about the distribution of information. So the question for the Assembly is, should that have been a criminal offence? I think it should have been. I think it's bad who did that should have been liable, or a civil servant or anyone else should have been allowed to be pursued for it. So the Official Secrets Act doesn't help because it's more of a national security. Uh, so there seems to me to be a gap here which was able to be exploited in RHI, and I think we should be closing it. I think we've seen enough precedent in NAMA, Red Sky, and who knows what else, to show that, that there does need to be that degree of penalty. Are we content to take the view and look to ourselves to the last clause? Great. Uh, clause 12. 12, 12 is just the, the cause, as I've explained before, to um, make sure that 
this isn't a moment in time inspection that we keep under review are there things we could do better mm -hmm. and therefore as court judgments come up and public bodies report that we have a stock take every two years to make sure that everything's been tidied up that needs to be tidied up. Comments? Enough. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And I, that oh, sorry, is. Chair, do we need to um, do the remaining clauses? There's also uh, further down then. There's clause 11A. All oh, right, 11A. Okay. Oh yes. Uh, clause 11A. Accountability of the Assembly provision of information. That's the one about making sure committees have yep. enhanced authority to seek information from departments without having to go through the rigmarole of 44. I can't think of any member of this committee who would object to that. Well, I think that's a sensible. Uh, given what we have been through since we've come back the last six months, we, the department has been atrocious with regards to accountability and transparency. I think this is a key element. Chair, just to keep myself right, do I also have to do, are we do 13, 14, 15? Okay. Clause 13, any comments? Commencement. The commencement date. Again, it's something I might want to revisit when we see at further consideration stage what How far we get point in the calendar we're at. Sir, just to go back to, to 11A, I mean, uh, I wanted to go back to 11 because I was going to because it links in with me with 11A. Is it worth getting any more evidence? I'm only asking the bill sponsor from the Department of Justice on that new amendment relating to the accountability to the Assembly provision of the information. I don't think so. I think the committee's people are making its own decision of those. How much evidence have we had on that? Have we had any specific evidence? So I apologise for... Sorry? I, I, have we had how much have we had much written evidence on that? I, I, I apologies again. I'm about the uh, about 11A. 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 Is that amend, does that amend the Northern Ireland Act then? No, hmm. I don't think so. It's uh, intended to strengthen uh, through the chair uh, the scrutiny function of the committee. Mm -hmm. It's a new clause, um, and that's why I'm linking back because in order for that, I have to ask that question on 11. To link it in with 11A. Uh, there was an issue in uh, re you know, to try to state that, that. Is there room there for a little bit more evidence? I, I, uh, to me, just speaking as the chairman of this, I don't think we need to see any more evidence that we're not getting sufficient information with, uh, that's being brought forward. And and speaking to other committee chairs, and indeed, as okay. you will speak to other people from other committees, the flow of information is. Um, to say the least, um, not acceptable. So I don't think we need to receive evidence to realise that that's what's happening. Okay. Just right. on that, yeah, I would back you up 100% there because so the request was should we ask the Department of Justice? I'm not really sure the Department of Justice is qualified, even on clause 11. And even if they are, are you taking the department's view or are you taking the minister's view? If you're taking the minister's view, is it a personal view or is it the view of the executive? Because we have been told in this very room by the head of the civil service that the executive does not support this bill. Now, I happen to know that that is not the case because I've spoken to individual executive members about this bill. So, you know, you have to ask the question, when is the evidence you're given by a department credible? Is I think I uh, just 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 move us on from here. And uh, bearing in mind, we don't have a head of the civil service anymore. So uh, uh, I think uh, look look at it, 11A. And I don't think uh, Pat, we need to get any extra evidence on that. Right. I think it's uh, I hate to say it's self-evident, but it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my question would be less about it's, it's almost less about the um, evidence as in kind of yeah, this is a great idea, or no, it's a terrible idea. But like, are there are um, obviously, this is where we kind of suffer from a dearth of like academics or think tanks. Is there anyone who is expert on the functioning of uh, or lack functioning of the Northern Ireland Assembly and its committees in academia who might want to give us contextualising information? I, I don't say that to hold up scrutiny, but I just, in terms of us being fulsome in terms of doing this, is there someone? And I'm happy. 
I'm happy to take away as a task to go away and think about it. I can see the everyone sort of want to go, but I love volunteering people. Well done, Matthew. Yeah. But, but you, the, <laughs> point, the point that I mean is there's a difference. Not all evidence is um, sort of partisan, yes or no. Some of the evidence is technical, ex technical uh, explanation and scrutiny okay. that um, we aren't always qualified to do because we yep. see what I mean. understand that, Matthew, but I think the issue here is it's the question of do we feel as committee members and members of this assembly that we're getting the necessary information that we're accepting? And I think the answer is that we don't need uh, outside academic uh, interest to explain to us we're not getting the flow of information we need. Sure. Just on the back of that, so uh, there has been a lot of evidence against the clause, um, clause 11. Uh, most of these do with the length of th that term, and what I'm trying to say is it may be worth getting some evidence on the clause 11a, because I'm not, sure, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure that how that all fits in with it. I, I hear you say it's self-evident. Mm. Uh, uh, we're at the point now where we're going to consult the turkeys on what yes. they, how they feel about Christmas. <laughs> uh, there is no way the civil service will want uh, yeah. clause 11a. <laughs> Or clause eleven. I'm not that, or the bill. That is, that is or the bill. Not that, that, that is not a I'm justification not to have it. Sorry, sorry. I, I, just to, to be absolutely clear, I, I, you're right, Paul. I, I'm not saying that they would. That's different. They're not. They're not consultees. As in, do, do you like this thing, which will create more of a burden and enable assembly committees to get more information from you? They're not going to. I was a civil servant. You like you don't you don't want anything which will add burden to your job, whether whatever, whether it's controversial or not. But. Oh, the, only, the only point I was making is that is it incumbent on us to ask for further technical evidence on the effect of this? Don't and I'm, that's not, I don't say that with any, in order to delay scrutiny, I just say that is it worth us doing it? As in, is it worth, and I'm happy to do it as a take as an action or someone on the dark team to literally just spend half an hour finding is there an academic I'm sorry, I'm just consulting here with the, the clerk. You sure could write us a couple of pages of. No. Okay. I'm um, sorry, could I make a point? Could I ask Claire, when that amendment was drafted, the bill's obvious, office obviously <laughs> believed it was within the competence of the Assembly uh, to make that change, because Matthew asked about the, the um, 98 Act. Uh, we can be assured that that's within the competence of the Assembly, and legal services agree with that, yes? Um, I haven't sort of formal uh, opinion. The, uh, Admissibility criteria does not include legislative confidence. Um, uh -huh. They will take a view on that. But uh, just to remind the members that they are, have been charged just to take a, a view on the bill yeah. um, as introduced. So, um, because that's what the committee was charged with to take a view on the bill as introduced. So, there's a. Matthew, as there's a proposal that you want to go away and uh, see if there's other sort of further information you can bring along to for the committee for 11A. Uh, will that so is the proposal that we otherwise take a vote today on or have a? We're not taking a vote. We're taking oh, a view. We're, we're, uh, we're taking what taking a view. I don't think I need to in order to delay us having a view okay. on the bill as a whole. If that's if, if that uh, okay. or to delay us. Okay, well, so we, we take a view on 11A, but we make, we make a note that your, uh, if there is further information, will come forward. I will go and have a th if there's anybody who can, yeah, who wants to give more detailed thoughts. Okay. So we got past 13, uh, plus 14. That's what is this interpretation? Interpretation, yeah. 15 is the short title. 15, happy with 15. Claire, are you happy with that we have taken a view? Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Committee. Uh, would anybody like to check it? Again? Schedule. Oh, schedule. Oh, schedule. Sure. Oh. The schedule is about the transitional payments, if, yes. if anyone was laid off because of this. Yeah. Are we yeah, content? Yes. Pretty standard. Right. If in that case, are we content? Are we content to take a short break for five? Sure. Who is pushing us out this time? You could say procedures, possibly. I can wait. For a quarter to this hour, or next yeah. hour. <laughs> quarter to three. From quarter to three, Claire. But uh, if it's any Claire, Claire, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. Claire. Yeah. We're back to normal time next week. <sighs> One.
wonder how Hunter will report me saying the word grump. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, Tim. And that completes the taking the view on the bill. If we move on to the next item of business, it's we're taking oral evidence on the October monitoring round, the departmental position. And can we invite Stuart and Janice to come in, please? A page. 27. 27. Page 28. Uh, Page 27? Yeah, 27, 28. Yep. All right. Hi, Janice. Hi, Stuart. Hello. I'd just like to remind you that the Clark's paper on the October monitoring round is on page 28. Uh, the Department of Finance have told me monitoring rounds page 30. And the templates are uh, tabled at page 3. Okay. Stuart, do you want to make an opening statement? Yeah, I'll just do a, a, a quick run through it for you. Um, as you know, back in, in June when we came, we had some, some substantial pressures, particularly in resource, around 21 million. Um, that was early in the year, and a lot of that was still in and around the uh, rates rebate scheme. So since that period of time, um, that has um, actually become clear, and we, we now find that, that the pressure now will be met by um, department communities for, um, for the bulk of that. So, at the moment, then our, our position is then that um, that pressure came down substantially, and um, it was about 3.8 million, most of which was the uh, reduced income across um, LPS. Um, However, we've had maybe around five million worth of um, easements elsewhere that's managed to offset that. So the net position from that is we're actually um, proposing to um, give up one million to the centre, back to the centre on that of resource. Um, on capital, I can actually update that we had five point nine million in there, and that was made up of um, sale of Northland. Um, yeah, what is Northland? Uh, it's a building um, round where the new university part is. It's an, an older building which is now sold to the university. Um, uh -huh. So um, it was on the market for some period of time a while to sell. So that's now being sold. Um, um, that 5.9 figure actually has gone up to 6.9 um, just very recently because the LPS Nova scheme, which was um, at one stage slippage of about a million, is now two million. Uh, and then we somewhat. Sorry, could you say that again? The L LPS Nova scheme, which is uh, replacing the r rates rebates or, or the rates um, collection system and uh, valuation, that sort of thing. That's a major project going on there. There's a bit of slippage in that progr program, um, so it's um, it's increased. So overall, uh, we have a capital easement of, of 6.9 million, which we're giving up to the centre now. And then there's some smaller projects about the department as well. Um, so that really is the summary of where we are at the moment. So it's one million um, resource we're giving up and 6.9 million capital. Chair, if I could come in. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Just on the table paper, we have a um, statement uh, around reduced requirements, and it states that due to offices remaining closed and not operating at full capacity, there has been a decrease in the amount of planned maintenance and a reduction in spend on fuel. On the planned maintenance, why why would a planned maintenance regime uh, be incumbent upon buildings being at full capacity? And well, I, I, it's maybe a, a badly phrased. I think the problem is. People haven't been able to get in, especially in the early days, in to do the maintenance um, in, in the early days, and that's delayed the plan, if, if, if you like. So it's maybe badly phrased from that point of view. It's just the actual workmen in the early stages weren't able to carry out the plan maintenance, so there's a reduction in cost for, from that point of view. Just, it strikes me that that would be the time to get plan maintenance done when the building is not operational or, or empty of people. Yes, and, and work has sort of started to carry on, but um, I say at, at, at the start of lockdown, um, you'll appreciate many businesses weren't willing to come in, and actually, I suppose the buildings weren't in a position, they hadn't been cleared out by that stage, and they weren't in a position to let people come in to do the work, but you know, work has started to progress on some buildings as well, but the plan has been delayed, hence the right, and then the fuel obviously was eating 
things like that isn't going on in the same position or air conditioning. The fuel aspect comes from. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Roof, uh, Sean Rees. You're very welcome to the season again. Uh, just there, where you've mentioned that uh, uh, delays on a number of projects. Can you give us any clarity there on those projects that have been delayed? Well, we say the major one was the um, the one in, the ones in LPS, which is the valuation and the um, rates collection, um, which has been delayed. There's some smaller ones. I think it's uh, there's some in the HR um, projects and was there Storm of the State. There um, would be another one. There's some plan maintenance in Storm of the State that's just been delayed. So LPS and um, HR, uh, human resources, on some of the um, systems that they were renewing there, and then plan maintenance and storing. Just, just quick one. Thanks, Mr. for bringing that up. When was the <coughs> project Novo? When was that supposed to have started? Um, well, it has actually started, but I mean they're just in the early stages of scoping. That at the at the moment, but, you know they've they've been doing um, the business cases and that at the moment, and I think talking to suppliers and things and scoping it. So it has started, um, and looking at the systems. But because they haven't gone to um, initial point or whatever it is, they haven't spent that a million quid. Yeah, yeah, because they haven't gone down far enough down the procurement route. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much for, for coming in. Um, I was going to ask what uh, they said just asked her, so that's good to know just uh, a lot of those projects and the maintenance we're going back on. In June, um, the department stated that it would need £21 million just for the rate uh, rebates. I'm trying to match this up myself, but it's now saying that the Department for Communities can cover this. Well, the department. Uh, so, sorry, I, I, but just to, so I know you're probably. How's this possible? That's the first bit. And if it is the case, would it not require sign-off from the executive? That's just the, the two points. The, depart the department for communities was always going to cover an element right. of that, and that happens every year. There's a budget transfer from communities comes across. At that stage, I think it was thought there would be a lot more people moving on to universal credit, right. um, and so it was. The information wasn't readily available at that time, so it, it was very much an estimate of what was going to happen. So we thought we'd need a lot more money um, coming across that communities couldn't have covered at that stage. But we, we've levelled out a bit, and it doesn't look quite as bad um, as, as what we first estimated. Mm. Okay. Which is why at the time we weren't putting a bid in for which we said, you know, we were raising it, but we weren't going to put a bid in the department until okay. it was clarified. Um, sir, our very diligent team here have noticed something. Um, um, the template provided a, a tab for RPM capital receipts, showing a capital receipt of, I think it's 2.5 million, which the department states has been surrendered. However, within the, the table or the titles, it says retained capital receipts where expenditure and receipt are inextricably linked, and increased capital expenditure from retained capital receipts. So, are we? Forward accounting for it. So this, you know, have we actually not received this receipt, or is it being surrendered yet for the department? What's happening? I've received the receipt. Yeah, we've received the receipt, um, and that's just um, shown obviously then the increase in income and the receipt, the surrender is part of the 6.9 million. Oh. Right. Okay. Anything else, team? Thank you. Okay. There you go. You're lucky. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very Good. much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Give our best back to the department. Say we missed them all. As always. Yeah. Do they miss us too? Oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> okay, team. Uh, next item on the agenda is the SL1, the Business Tennessee's Coronavirus Restriction on Forfeiture Relevant Period, Northern Ireland Amendment Number Two, Regulation 2020. To draw your members' attention to the, or draw the members' attention to the papers relating to the agenda item, the briefing note on page 34, the SL1 itself on page 36, and the department's response to the committee's consideration of the policy on page 38. Just give me a second while I look at page 38. Okay. Um, 
Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 provides that a right of re-entry or forfeiture under a relevant business tenancy for non-payment of rent may not be enforced. Relevant period is defined in as the period starting with royal assent and ending with the 30th of September 2020. The new draft rule would extend the relevant period of Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 to the 31st of December 2020. Regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. I remind the members that last week's meeting the Committee agreed to ask the Department for this SL1's date to be changed to the end of the financial year instead of the 31st of September 2020 in order to be in line with the Westminster statutory instrument. A response from the Department clarifies that the English statutory instrument was laid at Westminster on the 16th of September and the relevant period was on the 31st of December 2020. So I think uh, we're, that's where we're bound to that. Do we have any comments? If we are content, the members agree we state that the committee has considered Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restrictions on Forfeiture Relevant Period, Northern Ireland Amendment No. 2, Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Content? Content. We move on to Statute Rule 2020-2001, the Rates Coronavirus Electronic Communications Order, Northern Ireland 2020. Draw the members' attention to the, the briefing note at page 42, the SR at page 43. This order amends Article 62 of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977 in order to allow the District Valuer Certificate to issue electronically rather than by post. Due to the impact of COVID-19 outbreak in Northern Ireland, this electronic rule has been developed to provide LPS valuation staff with an alternative legal means of issuing certificates as a result of operational limitations created by COVID-19 arrangements. The regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure. We considered the SL1 at the meeting on the 24th of June 2020 and were content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy and content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. I draw the members' attention that the examiner's statutory rules is now reported on the SR on the 22nd report, and it's tabled at page 12. This report does not draw any special attention to the Assembly to the statutory rule. Do I have your agreement? We are content. We are therefore content that the Committee for Finance has considered Statutory Rule 2020-2001, the Rates Coronavirus Electronic Communications Order in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objections to the rule. Agreed. To move on to the Department of Finance, uh, item number eight, annual report of accounts 2019-2020. Inform the members of the Department of Finance has led its 2019-20 annual report and accounts in the business office of the committee will consider at the meeting next week. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the clerk's paper on page 49 and the Department of Finance's annual report and accounts, page 51. Uh, remind you that there, uh, an issue was highlighted last week from the report with regards to land and property service. It seemed to come up with monotonous regularity in our conversations, LPS, which identified a suspected misappropriation of 56 refunds by a staff member with a total value of 125,000. Um, one of the issues is that this hadn't been brought to our attention, despite we've had LPS in front of us. And there's been a few other issues that have come to the attention either through the media or through other things that LPS didn't bring to our attention. Um, I am minded to, with your approval, to ask for LPS to come back and talk to us, and if necessary, we have it in a closed session, because I want to have a, a full and detailed understanding of some of the issues that were going on within LPS because I don't think we're being, I don't think we've been appropriately informed. And furthermore, I wish to put on record, I am particularly disappointed in the sessions we've had with LPS and indeed with the permanent secretary, that some of these issues could have been raised and should have been raised. And I don't think we're being kept fully informed. I want to have a spirit of openness and transparency with the uh, Department of Finance and particularly with its subsidiary bodies I want them f to feel that they're able to come and talk to us on an open manner. But we need to be able to understand what is going on if we're going to provide s suitable scrutiny as well as support. So with your uh, approval, and we're looking, we'll discuss the forward work programme later, I would like to schedule in a session with the head of LPS. Are we content? Sorry, sorry. Melissa, sorry. 
uh, just to chair, um, I can understand why you would like to have that uh, meeting with uh, LPS. But what I don't agree with is just that uh, the sentiment that's been expressed there for it implies really as if there's been like a cover up on their part. I don't think that was the case. Uh, and uh, where we were sort of given that information in terms of um, uh, there being a misappropriation of funds, we'll say, by an employee or the likes of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that probably too is all subject to. Um, Court case and so on. Uh, just, just Melissa, just for information, it was actually reported in the papers yeah. in 2018. And I'm saying, but it was subject and to, we'll say, a court case and so on at the time, whatever, you know, the person no longer actually works, say, for uh, the department now either. And that, uh, again, too, the first, I don't object to um, the idea of asking the LPS to come along and put questions and that to them, but what I don't uh, sort of just tie in with is this. Implication really in your statement that there's an attempt on their part to cover up or to conceal information. I don't think that that's there. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Chair. Paul, and then. Uh, no, it's, it's Pat's point. Um, oh, sorry. Well, yeah. we're talking about £125,000. It's one member of staff that we said it's not a, like a witch hunt we're doing. But what we do need to know is how has this been dealt with? And what have the proper procedures now set in place? I don't think there are big questions in order to try and freeze out of this so if this doesn't happen again. And I think it's fairly reasonable for, for, for to ask that without going down the line of thinking that it's a witch hunt. I'm sorry it isn't, but that's what our job is here for in order to try and find out what happened and to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, Chair, I would agree with you 100%. Uh, I think we need to. Eat. Uh, get an explanation around this. Also, there was the issue around the dilapidation issue. Yeah. I'm not sure if LPS is actually in charge of that. I can't remember. Yeah. That's a massive issue too, which we have to touch on again yeah. with regards to discrepancies of the contests between what the department was prepared to pay out and what the owners yeah. of the buildings were prepared to pay out. I think that's a, an issue too, which we have to go on to. But I'm not sure if that's the LPS. I really don't. I'm speaking out loud, which is dangerous. Okay, and we'll, uh, on behalf of the committee, then we'll get in contact with the LPS. And moving on to the next item of business, um, uh, chairperson's business, um, item number nine: letter from the minister regarding his intention to make a statement to the assembly on public expenditure 2020, page 165, and the statement is tabled at page 19. Uh, the clerk and I had a good meeting with the minister uh, this week. And again, one of the questions we raised in the margins was the issue that now that there's not going to be a budget in set in Westminster, where does that where does that leave us with the whole panoply of things that we need to do as well? Um, I think again we should be asking the minister uh, what his proposals are going to be now that we were waiting for a budget to be set. The budget is not going to be set now. What are the implications, and how we're going to look, particularly at sort of the monitoring rounds, and where we're looking at the overall expenditure over the next uh, couple of months? So um, I think it's probably, and actually, it's probably not a bad time either for the minister to come in and for us to discuss some of those issues when he's uh, uh, fairly soon, when he gets an idea of what he's proposing to do. Bearing in mind there isn't a budget, I would propose that maybe not next week, but probably the following week when. Uh, the Minister has probably had a chance to think about how he's going to deal with the fact that there isn't a budget and also to look at the – we should have a much greater uh, understanding then of the potential outruns, uh, particularly with sort of the second wave of, wave of COVID and the implications of sort of the overall budget reposition and by which stage and, – and with this I'm in full sympathy with the Minister – I think the Minister would quite like to have had bids from indeed the Department of Economy and Department of Infrastructure to deal with some sort of really critical areas. And I think it's, um, you know, I'm all for applying criticism where it is, but actually the Minister has been put in an invidious situation where he doesn't have the bids so he can't give the money. So I think give it a period of two weeks and then we might ask the Minister to come in and then we'll be able to talk about some of these issues and about how we're going to manage the sort of the finances moving through to the next budgetary period. Chair, funny you should say that because I asked the Minister a question to the Minister of Finance around how many bids the Department of the Economy have made, and he refuses to answer that specific question. So I'm not 100% sure whether those bids haven't come forward. 
or whether it's the Minister of Finance just hasn't approved them. So I think we need to shine a light on that. The, the main point you make about the budget in Westminster, and, and now we're really left in a position where we're trying to pay catch up, to me this leads and lends itself to the argument that we need a static year-round budgetary process. If you look at what the Department of Finance has had to deal with with regards to Barnett f f uh, Formula consequentials over the past year and how they were able to populate the departments and sprinkle down that uh, uh, consequential money throughout the last number of months, there is no reason why they can't have a framework in place populating, populating that framework with timelines and, and, and financial lines. And then if there is a budget from Westminster at any given time, the repercussions of that then can be superimposed on top of that. But to, to say now, oh, we were waiting for a budget, oh dear, no budget's coming along, okay, we'll have to crank this up now. The one thing that suffers is transparency and accountability and consultation. And I don't think that's acceptable. So I, I do think we need to get to the bottom of this and put down somewhere a basis of going forward where we have a, a, a year-long budgetary process. Chair, if I may, just on the, I said this in, just for the purpose of putting it on the record, I said it in the Assembly Chamber yesterday, um, there's been a slightly puerile and frustrating desire to um, deflect responsibility onto the infrastructure minister over funding certain sectors. For the purpose of being absolutely clear in this um, committee, the legal virus for funding certain transport industries has never sat with the infrastructure minister. Any implications otherwise were wrong. That has been underlined by the fact that the executive office took it upon itself to announce that they were granting legal powers to the infrastructure minister. If they didn't need to do that, then why? If, the, if that had been, you know, if she had had the power all along, then why did they need to transfer that power in the first place? Now, the next point is people have raised specific questions about. Uh, bids or no bids or lots of bids from the economy department. There's been a lot of chatter about, um, and I've been one of them raising it. If we, you know, it is within our part. You've said, Chair, that you have some sympathy with the minister in the department in terms of lack of bids from the economy department. Why don't we, as a committee, ask the economy department to tell us what bids they have made and ask us and tell us whether they think. Uh, the, either the finance department or other executive colleagues have been in some way obstructive in terms of delivering the economy minister what she would like in terms of her bids. I think that would be a, an entirely legitimate thing for our committee to do, given we have seen it as uh, uh, we've written to other ministers and other committees. Agreed. Are you reading my notes? <laughs> Are you reading my notes? Agreed. I think there's. I think it's a proposal there, and I think it might be useful if we're having the minister to come and talk to us in a couple of weeks' time, as if we write as a, as I write as the chair of the committee on behalf of the committee to uh, economy infrastructure, well, write to all the ministries yes. and say, have you submitted any bids and where is the process of the, and what have you submitted bids for? And do you feel that they haven't been, they feel that they haven't been received? And I think that is a very valid sort of approach for us, for us to do. I also, I'm interested in what the uh, deputy chair's comments are, because I think one of the things bearing in mind the conversation we've had with both the Minister and the Permanent Secretary, when I think it was the Permanent Secretary said, what could we be doing working cooperatively together? I think we as a committee could be looking at setting a framework for discussion with the Department about how we should be looking at a formalised budgetary process to, to look at that. And indeed, at that stage of conversation, I think that would be a very productive set of conversations to have with the Finance Minister and the Permanent Secretary, and would help considerably as we start moving into the new budgetary cycle. Are we content? Sure, can I tie this down? A uh, time frame, bids in the last, or bids since the... Since we've been back. Since we've been back. And and since January. Are we talking about COVID or non-COVID or both? No, yes. it's all, it, because oh. it, all bids. It's, it, if you look carefully at the estimates, mm. some of them are now being yeah, conflated because of what's happening with the monitoring rounds. Yeah. So I think we can't just say from COVID, it has to be from all bids. And Chair, is that all bids, whether successful, partially success, successful yes, no, or unsuccessful? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that would be useful for us to get on, on the back of what Matthew said, I, I can tell the committee that uh, 
the Minister of um, has met with the industry and is meeting with them and any one uh, you know uh, the minister's meeting to discuss the way forward with the industry and the taxis and the haulage when she gets this power brought over to her from okay. TO. so it's worth noting is she on loudspeaker now pat is no 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 no, no. I, just, uh, I just wanted that put down on the rack <laughs> you won't be able to do that with Jim's large folks any potholes just shout now while she's on the line <laughs> okay uh just uh, just as we just as uh, going through sort of any other business, any member have any other items of business? Yes. Can I bring up a very serious point? I don't know if the members picked it up this week, but there has been a minister in this assembly chamber, minister? justice minister, and I know this is finance, but it brings me to my point. Oh yeah. yeah. Stated in this assembly chamber this week that her department found out about a very serious issue relating to the courts and trials and the minister wasn't told for a full three months. Now, I don't know, but that sent alarm bells ringing in my ear with regards to how a department can make a deliberate decision to sit on information without actually expressing even an indication to the minister that something is seriously wrong. Now, I think, that is seri I think that's a serious flaw. So I've asked questions around this. But whilst they talk about justice there, it also then relates to the issue that we have been experiencing with regards to the information and records management policy within the Department of Finance. And how, when I have asked questions around the, whether we have received all the information on the emails that we requested and who made the de deliberate action and decision within the department to give us some emails and not others. And I think we need to know as a department how that thought process and that decision, how that decision was come to. <coughs> also we have saw in those e emails the fact that there was a red alert email sent from the Republic of Ireland. And I have asked questions around how that was actually interfaced with and reacted to by our department. And again, all they have done is point at me in the direction of the department's information and records management policy. They will not go into any detail as to the thought process and the actual apparatus of how they come to a decision like that. Now, to me, this is a fundamental issue. If a minister has been deliberately withheld, information has been deliberately withheld from the, from the minister for a period of three months on something as fundamental as the error that we heard about this week, there's something fundamentally wrong with the civil service interaction between them and ministers, no matter who the minister is. So I think it's something further we need to explore. Now, if the Minister is coming in a couple of weeks' time, I'm prepared to let it sit until then. But it's just to inform the committee of how serious I believe this now is. Is that a written policy, the information policy? Yep, it is. It's a Department's Information and Records Management Policy, which is available online, seemingly. Uh, and Sorry, Chef, are you suggesting that that is that the same issues that you would see in terms of information record management that you would see in finance or that you think are there in finance are that those are the same things at root in justice yeah, yeah. so so who who makes the ultimate decision to withhold information to a minister the 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 issue about the the, the point i say i was not paying close attention to that I I mean, I'm aware of what the announcement was, but I didn't ask a question. It was about a, a criminal justice, a, 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 an error in the criminal justice system. Um, Next week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I suppose my question is whether that is. They would seem to be quite distinct things. No. So for me, it's all about not the subject matter, but the actual process of getting information. Well, to I'll let you in, but I just if I was a minister of any department. And there was something seriously flawed, something that maybe wasn't even my fault, maybe it wasn't even my problem, but I think I would still want to hear about it. But yet, civil service, a civil servant 
had to have made the decision deliberately not to inform. And I, that's where I want to get to. I want to get how does the information flow and how, what is the policies around that information and when is it right and not right to tell a minister or even a permanent secretary or even a grade five or, or how does that actually work, that information flow? Apologies, Deputy Chair, but we're, um, I'm being informed that uh, we're being completely time compressed here. Melissa, you just want to come in on a point? On that point, and I have another point to raise as well, too. Yeah, yes, please, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly, uh, that uh, who makes the decision to withhold inf information from the Minister? I do think that that's probably a discussion for an appropriate committee, which is not the Finance Committee, and I suspect that this might be a back door to opening up an issue that has already been dealt with and uh, finished with and completed within this committee. That's one point. Yeah, yeah. Second point I want to make just very quickly is in relation to uh, a letter I think that you had actually sent out yourself, yeah. Chair, uh, and you sent it out in the name of uh, the Chair of the Finance Committee. Yes. And uh, that, uh, the content of that letter had never been discussed within this committee. Uh, or by this committee, and uh, no position ever was uh, taken uh, on it by the members of this committee. And it's implied in the letter in early, as well, too, like, that uh, you have both the British government on one side and the European Union on the other, and they're both equally culpable uh, and, uh, uh, in, in terms of coming to a resolution of um, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement and so on. And, uh, and I think that, that was totally inappropriate for you to adopt that position, to send out that letter as chair of this committee without that business having been dealt with within this committee, because it is, of, as my opinion, and in this case too, it's very much reflected in terms of the majority of the people of, of the north of Ireland, that when it comes to the withdrawal agreement, that the European Union, if anything, uh, were the very people who were defending the rights of the people of the north of Ireland, as opposed to the position adopted by the British government, that they have chosen to break the law in order for them to drive a coach and horses through all other arrangements. And I do think, uh, Chair, that um, that was inappropriate of you to send out that letter in the first instance in the name of this committee. Sorry, three, three points to that, Melissa. First one, apologies. It was going to be the next item of business, but since we've now been time compressed, we weren't going to be able to do that, and I was going to raise those sessions the second one. The second point was I raised the position very clearly on the floor of the Assembly. I said at the floor of the Assembly in Hansard Refers, as chair of the uh, Finance Committee, I would write to the other chairs, and the information would be then sent to the chairs as required, and also be writing to the Speaker. So that was the process it was. We were going to debate it and discuss it at the next item of business here, but um, we have just we have run out of time, so we can, take that for, we can take that for discussion next week, and I'm more than happy to discuss it at detail then uh, next week, because there is there's a wide range of views, particularly Melissa, on this issue. But again, one of the big significant issues, particularly to do with the protocol, is there are two sides of it. There is the EU side and the United Kingdom side of it, but most importantly is the side of it for the people of Northern Ireland and where we Sit. Now, I have some good news because next week we are at 2 p.m. Chair. 2 p.m. and we are still in the Senate chamber. Yes, Chair. Okay. And is Senate. that going to be the? That is the. Now the that is the that is the change time in this week, and we will have nobody behind us. No, Chair. The uh, the only thing is that that's subject to change by 30 minutes every now and again to allow for a standing committee to. A slot in, so it may some weeks start at 2:30. Okay. And a committee, uh, apologies. I know we had quite a lot to do today, but we did need to give due consideration to Jim's bill. Yeah. And um, there is sort of one other one other item of business I just wanted to quickly bring up. Uh, we were discussions about uh, the public sector reform. We had some discussions last week. And we agreed we were going to put off calling for any evidence sessions until we had a good chance to speak to the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, I think was our collective view. Uh, things have moved on. So one of the things I would like yeah, to discuss... Moved. You know what I mean. <laughs> and, uh, however, I don't think we should be delaying uh, the opportunity to gather evidence on reform within the civil service. And maybe we should be placing that, because our forward work programme has been to look a bit slack. And maybe we should be start looking to look into that. Sorry, Matthew. Two things. One, it would be good if, if we have a specific item to, to discuss if there is going to be any further development on the 
a letter from the Finance Committee or a proposed letter between chairs to discuss that and to discuss how it's framed in the, in the, on, on, on Brexit and the protocol. Yeah, that'd be um, nice um, second, the lack of appointment of head of civil service is uh, outrageous and it is something that we uh, should be, I, I think we are, the, you know, as well as the executive office, we are the committee that is directly charged with lots of, with overseeing lots of civil service management. I think it is something that we should give thought to in terms of having an evidence session to um, to discuss the consequences of that and the reasons for that. I don't know uh, if the Executive Office Committee is planning as a session at any point soon with the First and Deputy First Minister, but you know, to be blunt, we are in the middle of the biggest public health crisis in a century. We are 100 days away from the end of the transition period. Whatever your perspective on Brexit, it's an enormous thing to be managed. Um, we're less than a we're little more than half a year away from actually reinstating the institutions. It's not acceptable that, given the notice that we don't have a head of the civil service appointed, and this committee should be asking questions about it. Thank, thank you very much, Dean Matthew. And Jim has been giving me sort of very definitely tele tele telepathic views as of no, this is not an area we should be no. concerning ourselves. That is with the executive department or the executive committee. However, there is an issue here. It's on uh, HR and the fact that the HR function relies and stays within the finance committee. There may be questions that may evolve over the next uh, week or two that we may consider we want to bring in uh, HR, I can't remember the anachronism, what it is, but the, uh, the part of the Department of Finance. Next that's HR. Next, that's one, next HR. I apologise to all those who work in that department to discuss sort of that process and any of the implications that come from that. I think that would be a more appropriate use of our time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Do uh, you wish to defer the item until session until next? Yes, week? we will have. We don't have any option. You've just told me we're getting booted out. Have that record, yeah. Can you arrange for them to come next week as well? Okay, at, yeah. um, but now after our meeting starts. No, definitely not. Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.